Welcome to Fatal Fad Fridays, where we flex our brains and talk about diet culture on Fridays. My name is Brittany Howard, and I'm a blunt dietitian and an ex-dieter, and I'm here to talk to you about the dangers of dieting, all spooky season long. Diet culture has become a staple of our society, and it often controls our choices because we have it grained in our brain that being thin equals being healthy. Spoiler alert, that is false. So let us fire up our brains and our metabolisms, and let's get into today's topic. It's a long one, buckle in. According to the American College of Allergy, Asthma, and Immunology, more than 50 million Americans have an allergy of some kind. For food allergies, it's estimated that four to six percent of children and four percent of adults are affected. So it's not as mainstream as the diet industry makes you believe because four to six percent is a low number. And they're trying to scare you into buying these products and cutting out specific food groups because again, like we've said before, diet culture is real and it is a marketing scheme to design to make you guys buy shit. Food allergy symptoms are actually the most common in babies and children, but they can appear at any age. And technically speaking, a food allergy occurs when the body's natural defenses, AKA our immune system, overreacts to the presence or exposure to our particular substance, treating it as it's like a foreign invader. So you're playing space invaders in your body and you're like, get out of my space. And it's sending out chemicals to defend against it in order to protect the body from that invader. In this case, potentially a food that you've consumed. Allergies, can be mild to severe, and not all reactions are the same, and it varies each time you're exposed to the same food. My rashes were all over the place. <laughs> they were very different. Um, anyway, the most severe allergic reaction is anaphylaxis, which is a life-threatening allergic reaction that impacts your breathing, causes a dramatic drop in your blood pressure. It's actually very scary, and it affects your heart rate, so it's almost like what? We think of someone who got stung by a bee and you see them swell up and like they can't breathe and all that kind of stuff. Like think of that. So anaphylaxis can come on within minutes of exposure to a trigger food. Um, it can be fatal, fatal meaning you could die, and must be treated promptly with an injection of epinephrine, which is also like, it's a drug name, but it's adrenaline. And food allergy reactions may look like that, or they could look like vomiting, stomach cramps, hives, shortness of breath, wheezing, repetitive coughs, shock or circulatory collapses, tight, hoarse throats, trouble swallowing, swelling of the tongue, affecting the ability to talk or breathe. Some of those are all things that may happen in anaphylaxis or they can all happen separately. Um, having a weak pulse, pale or blue coloring of the skin, feeling dizziness or feeling faint. And then as we talked about before, anaphylaxis is like the cherry on top. So most symptoms occur within two hours of ingesting the culprit food, but often within minutes. So it could take a little while for your body to process it, but often it's pretty quick. Um, in more rare cases, it can be delayed by four to six hours or more, especially if it's what we call FPIs, for food protein induced enterocolitis syndrome. <laughs> it's a mouthful. Um, which is another type of delayed food reaction that stems from uh, pretty much a severe gastro gastrointestinal reactions that occur two to six hours after consuming milk, soy, or certain grains, or depending on what it is, some other solid foods. So with FPIs, it is more likely that it's possibly delayed. Anyway, it, allergies most likely occur in young infants where they're being exposed to these foods for the first time or they are being weaned. Um, also specifically for SPIs, that happens too, primarily in children. Um, it often involves repetitive vomiting and can lead to dehydration. And in some instances, if it's a baby, the baby can develop bloody diarrhea because the symptoms resemble those of what we would consider a viral illness or bacterial infection, diagnosis of food allergies or FPIs may be delayed. FPIs is a medical emergency that should be treated with IV rehydration. So like you're, like, you're losing fluids, like you need to be re-given those. Um, food allergies in general though are often diagnosed through a system of analysis of several different things. Um, but one of the things that you may hear about, especially as we're talking through these testing, is IgE antibodies. So an IgE is immunoglobulin E, um, and the IgE tests are associated with food allergies and allergic responses specifically. So an IgE um, is typically what we would use to give us the thought that we're on the way to diagnosing a true allergy. Um, and it's the antibody responsible for initiating and perpetuating that allergic reaction. 
So we measure this through a blood test and the results are given as a number to indicate the likelihood of being allergic. So this alone does not just say you are allergic. Um, not to be confused with IgG. So IgG, which is immunoglobulin E, is different from IgE. Um, you still can test for antibodies for both, uh, but the IgG is what a lot of these home allergy tests are saying can help with your food allergy, not allergy, your food intolerances. Let's break that down a little bit more. Before I dive into IgG a little bit more, the IgE antibodies can also similarly identify environmental allergens that can be a problem for you. So it's not just for food. Um, IgE is usually present in small amounts in the blood, but an elevated level can be a sign that the body is overreacting to a specific allergen. So that's why we wanna look at that one. IgG, so immunoglobulin G, um, are more of a memory antibody, meaning they don't predict a food allergy or an intolerance. Instead, they're a response of the immune system after the body has already been exposed to something. In this case, as we're talking about food, a food. So it's no wonder that if you're testing at these home results kits and you've recently eaten something, and if it's an IgG test, that it's gonna come back that you have this long list of foods that you need to remove because all IgG indicates is that the person tested eats a varied diet and doesn't suggest a food allergy or an intolerance, but just that you've eaten it recently. So it's very important, especially if you are deciding to buy one of these for whatever reason, uh, but for whatever reason that you, <laughs> that you um, really know what's being tested here. So according to the American Academy for Allergy, Asthma, and Immunology, what a mouthful, but a great place, IgG and the IgG subclass antibody tests for food allergy do not have clinical relevance. They are not validated, they lack sufficient quality control, and should not be performed, quote, unquote. Rephrased, they don't recommend IgG to diagnose a food allergy or an intolerance because it may result in people avoiding healthy foods and cutting them out, AKA, they scare you into thinking that you should be removing certain foods to classify them as bad for you because of these tests. And if you remove it miraculously, all your problems are gonna go away and you're gonna be thin. And we already know that removing foods unnecessarily can limit nutritious benefits or lead to nutritional deficiencies, as I say, every time. And it can lead to disordered eating habits. So if this is your first introduction to one of my videos, all those things can happen. So there are nine common food allergens and eight account for about 90% of all reactions. So the top eight that you typically maybe have told that you maybe were told that you were allergic to or have heard of are eggs, milk and dairy, peanuts, tree nuts, fish, shellfish, wheat, and soy. And the ninth, according to the FDA under the FASTER Act of 2021, sesame it was added as the ninth major food allergen and it's effective coming this January 1st, 2023. So we have eight right now, nine coming up. And once a food allergy is diagnosed, the most effective treatment is to avoid the food. So children may outgrow their allergic reactions to milk and eggs um, and peanut and tree allergies are likely to persist, but we're learning more and more about allergies and how they get diagnosed and how they can be prevented. So let's go into that a little bit more. So how do you get diagnosed? Well, if you suspect a food allergy, see an allergist. Don't get one of these tests. <laughs> um, the allergist will ask you questions about your family, your medical history, and then based on that, decide which test to perform, if any, because it could be a variety of things causing your symptoms, and use that information to determine if a food allergy exists. So be prepared to answer questions about like what and how much you ate recently, how long it took for the symptoms to develop, what symptoms specifically you were experiencing, and how long they lasted. So after the allergist takes your history, they may order some skin tests or a blood test, so it can actually be taken in a vial, or you know those ones where they like stick needles in your body and like label them and stuff, um, which indicate whether food-specific IgE antibodies are present in your body. So, um, a little bit deeper, the skin prick test provides results in about 20 minutes. So what they do is they give you a liquid that contains a tiny amount of the food allergen and they place it on the skin of your arm or your back. I've actually gotten it both places. 
um, and your skin is pricked with a small sterile probe, allowing the liquid to seep under the skin. And then they look for like little domes that are on your skin. And so the test is considered positive if, if a wheel, what they call the bump that would develop, that looks like kind of like a mosquito bite, develops at the site pricked. And as a control, because they want to make sure that you're not just reacting to everything or the needle itself, because like that can happen too, you'll also get a skin prick with a liquid that doesn't contain the allergen just as a control factor. So they compare the level of the reaction to that. So it should not provoke a reaction, but if it does, we also know that other things could be happening. Um, so they allow the two test sites to be compared to evaluate the reaction. Blood tests, which are a little bit different than the skin prick, um, are less exact than the skin tests but they measure the amount of the IgG antibody to the specific foods being tested um, when they run your blood. And so because it's a larger like sample of blood and stuff, the results are typically available in about a week and they are reported as a numerical value, which is then interpreted to determine the likelihood of a potential food allergy and they cross-reference that with your symptoms and what you said and all that history, which is why that history needs to be there. So before either of these, um, you're usually asked to stop any certain medications like allergy meds, antihistamines, some heartburn medications, some topical stuff, um, which could interfere with your testing results. So if you're definitely having some type of allergy and things like that, like you wanna make sure that you talk to somebody first so you know what you have to do. Um, if the test is negative, it can also be useful in ruling out an allergy. So if it's definitely, there's no IgG, IgE, then that's, you know, that's a very good indicator that it's probably not that. Um, if it's positive, they may do what's called an oral food challenge to determine what the food does and if it's problematic. So even after the blood tests are performed, an oral food challenge may be conducted. It's usually, actually, the oral food challenge is considered the gold standard for food allergy testing, which is so funny because we're doing all these home allergy tests, but no one talks about the oral food test. So for the oral food allergy test, under medical supervision, a patient is given a small amount of the allergen orally, then increasing bigger amounts of the allergen, and they're monitored for signs of the reaction. So as you can imagine, this test takes a little bit of time. Um, if they show no signs, it means their body tolerates it, and they are not usually considered allergic. So just because you may have a little bit of an elevated IgE level does not mean an allergy, and then they do the oral food test as well. If you do react, it means the body does not tolerate the food. You are then considered allergic, and the food should be avoided. So, once diagnosed, there could also be an issue with cross-reactivity. So what that means is, for example, you were diagnosed with an allergy to a tree nut. Um, so you may have issues with other type of nuts, um, just like someone is allergic, potentially allergic to shrimp, and may have issues with other shellfish, but they're not gonna test for every type of shellfish or every type of thing like that, usually. So this is important, and it's one of the reasons that an at-home allergy test isn't usually sufficient and enough to get people to start thinking about what an actual allergy or positive result could mean, because it can mean a lot of different things. And then people start avoiding a whole bunch of foods just because it said this. So let's define food sensitivity a little bit more to compare the difference. So a lot of people confuse a food allergy with a food sensitivity, um, also known as a food intolerance. And while bothersome, a food intolerance is a less serious condition that does not involve the immune system. So sensitivity equals intolerance, not an allergy. And with food intolerances, what happens is the digestive system may be what's affected. So you're like, I'm gassy, I'm bloated, I got a poop, all that kind of stuff. It's possible it may be a sensitivity, but not an allergy. Um, these aren't typically life-threatening, like a food allergy could be. Um, so some symptoms of a food intolerance may include, like I just said, gas, which is actually kind of fun. If you have a lot of gas, it's funny. But gas, bloating, cramping, diarrhea, constipation, and nausea. All the common things you know when people are like, I don't feel good after I eat this. Um, for those types of symptoms, skin tests and IgE blood tests may not be helpful in figuring out what's causing your symptoms because it may not invoke an immune reaction. So it's not gonna tell you shit. Um, there are other ways to diagnose intolerances though. So because food allergies are very specific, um, people do often confuse them with other issues because some of the symptoms of an allergy are what I just told you are symptoms of a sensitivity, which is why it's important to talk to an allergist. Um, <laughs> so let's discuss some other common conditions as well that can be mistaken for food allergies. So for example, you may not have adequate amounts of an enzyme digested to, to, needed to digest certain foods. Some people also have to take digestive enzymes. Um, insufficient quantities of the enzyme lactase, for example, reduce your ability to digest lactose the main sugar in milk products. 
Um, lactose intolerance can cause bloating, cramping, uh, diarrhea, and excess gas. But they also make things where the lactose is already digested, like lactate milk, or you can take a lactate pill. Doesn't mean you're allergic, and you can still go on and enjoy the food. Um, sometimes if you have food poisoning, it can allergic or mimic an allergic reaction. Um, bacteria in spoiled fish or tuna or something like that can actually have a toxin release that triggers harmful reactions in your body. Um, some people um, also have digestive reactions and other symptoms after eating certain food additives or, um, yeah, food additives. So for example, sulfites used to preserve dried fruit, canned goods, or wine can trigger um, different types of things in people with sensitivities or even asthma attacks if you have an issue with the food additive. Um, certain fish like tuna or mackerel that are not refrigerated properly um, and also depending on the size of them can contain high amounts of bacteria that um, could cause problems in the body and they may contain high levels of histamine as well which an antihistamine you know is what goes against what causes aller like allergy symptoms and stuff like that and like inflammation so if it has a lot of histamine it can have some similar reactions like a food allergy um, and rather than an allergic reaction this is known as histamine toxicity or scombroid poisoning. So it's like a thing. Um, and while celiac disease is sometimes referred to as a gluten allergy, it doesn't result in anaphylaxis. So like a food allergy, um, celiac disease does involve the immune system response, but it's a unique reaction specifically um, to gluten that's more complex than a simple food allergy. And we cover this a little bit more in the gluten being a villain video that we've talked about. So if you did not get a chance to look at that when you wanna learn more about gluten and celiac, have at it, it's over on my channel. So, um, in addition to all these people can be allergic to pollen. So known as oral allergy syndrome or pollen food allergy syndrome. So with this syndrome, certain fresh fruits and vegetables or nuts and spices can trigger an allergic reaction that causes the mouth to tingle or itch. Have you ever had that happen to you? It sucks. <laughs> um, in serious cases, the reaction results in a swelling of the throat or even anaphylaxis. And that's not even from the food, that's from the pollen that is around where the food is growing. I mean, cross-reactivity may play a role here if there are certain allergies causing, like certain allergy causing proteins in the certain pollens that are being consumed. So if it's pollen related, the allergen may be destroyed by heating the food, which can then be consumed no problem. So there's a lot of things to consider here rather than just taking one of these home tests and hoping that that's you know, the alleviation of all of your symptoms. So now that we know what food allergies are and what they aren't and different considerations, let's go back to the food allergy piece. So now we've talked about why testing with an allergist specifically is important and it's not as simple as just taking an IgE test. Um, specifically, let's talk about the home allergy kits and the trends to test for allergies at home and how it relates to diet culture. Ready? Let's go. So these kits may offer convenience on the surface but they aren't truly doing what they are marketed to do. Instead, they are causing people to label foods as bad and then cut them out of the diet for wrong reasons. <laughs> My cat just came back inside. There are many cons to home allergy testing. The one big one that I can think of is that testing to diagnose food allergies or intolerances you don't have because of the high risk of false positives and because the internet told you that you may likely have a food allergy, especially if no symptoms are present, is just a way to get you to spend money. And it's not actually a test that can diagnose an allergy or an intolerance. Um, these tests cannot diagnose things like lactose intolerance or FODMAPs, and they can't detect potentially serious food-induced food conditions like celiac disease. They just, they don't do that. Um, these tests come with a high price point usually, and some of these tests still involve a visit to a lab to get the blood work. Hello, kitty. Um, so you may still have to actually go somewhere, pay to get your blood work done, if you, especially if you don't have a doctor's order, you know, you can do that now, um, but it costs money. And then the tests that they're doing for you may not be regulated um, in their little kits. And they don't provide treatment plans for potential intolerances or allergies that may show up a lot of the time. They may just give you a fact sheet or something like that. Um, many don't test for IgE antibodies, and they measure IgG instead, which is, like we said, what you just ate um, or recently ate, and they don't actually reveal any, al any allergies. Also, for the food intolerance symptoms mentioned, these cannot be diagnosed with an at-home intolerance test. They're not looking for that. They're not asking you, have you had diarrhea? Test for this. They're a little bit of blood, hoping for an IgE or IgG, and again, not the end-all be-all. 
And if you suspect dairy, gluten, or caffeine may be triggering your symptoms, the at-home test won't do anything for you. So depending on what it is, it's just a waste of money. And even worse, you may end up with misleading results. Go see an allergist <laughs> if you're having trouble. Um, some at-home allergy tests also claim to be able to diagnose food sensitivities through the food IgG test. Um, as I mentioned before, from the allergy, um, the academy, um, they don't recommend this. And the testing that they would typically say that you're intolerant to, they, they're saying you can be intolerant to 90 to like 100 different intolerances. And then they want you to remove these foods from your diet to improve multiple symptoms before um, you do anything. And just the Academy, the American Academy of Allergy, Asthma and Immunology, that's what it's called, um, states that these tests have never been scientifically proven to be able to accomplish what they are reporting that it does. So marketing by lying at its finest. The IgE panel for testing for foods is also controversial. It's rarely recommended by allergy societies, especially when done without the proper and thorough medical history of the patient. It's not gonna be able to actually, per, like actually firmly diagnose anything. You're diagnosing it for yourself. And in these cases, it's common that 50% to 90% of IgE, result, IgE results without a proper reading can incorrectly be, or be identified. Mm. So once diagnosed, what's the treatment for a food allergy? Avoidance. Avoiding that food and anything else it may be called for or go by on a food label. You need to, at this point, carefully check ingredient labels for food products and learn what you need to avoid and other names it may go by. So we have food labels to help with this. Um, while labeling has helped make this process a bit easier, some foods are so common um, that avoiding them is really challenging. But a dietitian like me may be able to help because that's what we're trained in, is to help read food labels and stuff like that. Um, we make sure to offer tips for avoiding foods that trigger your food allergies, but also to make sure that you will still get all the nutrients you need and you're not cutting out anything that is unnecessary so you can still have a be the best relationship with food as possible. And also food allergies may not be forever. Some allergies may disappear over time and others may stay permanently. <laughs> so it ranges. And if the allergy may be severe, the allergist may prescribe an EpiPen. So in the event that you come into contact with the allergen, you can administer this to stop the anaphylaxis. So if it's a true allergy, like you may be pricking yourself with a big ass needle um, if you come into contact with it. And if you do have that, anyone with that type of food allergy should always have two doses available because the severe reaction can occur, um, reoccur in about 20% of individuals. And like we said before, the reaction varies each time. So there's no data to help predict who may need a second dose of epinephrine. So this recommendation applies to all patients with a food allergy just to be extra safe. Because if you have one and it's triggering your immune system, it could be life or death. So if you need that, use epinephrine immediately. If you experience severe symptoms such as shortness of breath, repetitive coughing, weak pulse, hives, tightness in your throat again, any trouble breathing or swallowing, or a combination of any of those symptoms from different body areas, <laughs> such as hives, rashes, or swelling on the skin, coupled with vomiting, diarrhea, or abdominal pain. My cat is so spoiled. <laughs> Repeated doses of epinephrine also may be necessary. Once you give yourself the epinephrine or someone gives it for you, you need to call an ambulance and inform the dispatcher that epinephrine was administered and more may be needed. This is like super serious. So just telling somebody you have a food allergy just because you don't want something at like a restaurant or something like that makes you a dick, I'm just saying. Um, so anyway, if, it's, if it warrants epinephrine, use it right away. If you're not sure if it warrants epinephrine, but you were, you were given this, usually they say to use it right away because the epinephrine um, risks outweigh the risks if you are gonna die. Um, so anyway, the answer for food allergy treatment is to avoid, avoid, avoid. And to protect those with food allergies and other food hypersensitivities, the FDA enforces regulations requiring companies to list ingredients on packaged, packaged foods and beverages, AKA the food label. You love food labels, you love food. This is my poison checker. She checks everything for me first. So for certain foods and substances that cause allergies, there are more specific labeling requirements. So Congress passed the Food Allergen Labeling and Consumer Protection Act of 2004. Um, this law identified eight foods that we've talked about at the beginning of this video as the major food allergens. So just to recap what those are, milk, eggs, fish, um, crustacean shellfish, tree nuts, peanuts, wheats, and soybeans. 
And on April um, 23rd, 2021, um, the Food Allergy Safety Treatment Education and Research Act was signed into law to make sure that sesame is added as a ninth one starting January 1, 2023. So nine major food allergens, and they do have to be, you know, usually referenced on the label in some type of capacity, but it could be called something really fancy. Um, so that's why it's important to kind of know all the names that dairy goes by. For example, if they see if you, you're allergic to milk, depending on what you're allergic to, you need to know if it's casein or whey, um, dried milk, dried proteins, that kind of stuff. So this time the FDA does not establish a threshold level for any allergens. So what that means is a threshold is a value be below which it's unlikely that a food allergen, a food allergenic, wow, a food allergic individual would experience an adverse side effect. So we don't know what that is for everybody. It's different. So they don't have it on the label. So consumers may also see advisory statements such as may contain nuts or produced in a facility that also uses this, something like that. And those statements are not required by law. Um, and they can be used to address any type of unavoidable cross contact or cross reactivity things. Um, only if manufacturers have incorporated good manufacturing processes in their facilities. So it's not required, they're doing it to be nice and help you out, so that's great. Um, they've also, usually if they're putting something on there, they've taken every precaution to avoid cross contact that can occur when multiple foods um, are made in these different facilities that have different allergen profiles, just to be on the safe side, but it doesn't mean that you're in the clear they want you to be aware like there is a possibility that some of this equipment or some of the production line countertops or something like that may have been touching this other type of food even though if they were sanitized and clean because we don't know the levels that people react again um, they want you to know that there is a possibility for this cross reactivity so are food allergies inevitable new studies are showing that early introduction of allergens for example peanuts or peanut based products have been associated with a lower risk of developing a peanut allergy. For example, there are new recommendations based on this that have been changed um, to include peanut-based products around four to six months of age in infants um, to try to prevent any type of peanut allergies later on in life. So although it's still relatively new, um, researcher, researchers are found finding that high-risk children who regularly consume peanut protein, such as peanut butter or peanut flavored snacks, ouch, that hurts me, um, were around 80% less likely to develop a peanut allergy. That's huge, especially if there's like, ow, family history or something like that. She's done, she done, <laughs> ow. So in other words, avoiding allergens may be associated with the development of an onset of an allergy, but the research, more research is coming. So the bottom line is do not waste your money if you aren't having any symptoms, this test isn't gonna tell you anything. If you are having some type of symptoms, see an allergist because they can rule out or diagnose an allergy. Um, they can also guide you in the right direction or you can see a physician first and see if there's something else and then they may refer you to an allergist. But that way you can get further help and find relief. This home allergy test is pretty much a waste of your time in my opinion. We need to listen to our bodies learn how to eat less restrictively and honor our hunger and fullness cues while choosing nutrient dense foods more often and avoid labeling foods as good and bad and going with this restrictive mentality that like we need to cut out a bunch of these things in our diets to be healthy. Do not get sucked into the many foods are bad for you myth or convincing marketing because marketing is just trying to get you to buy all these products so that they can make money and they're doing a damn good job at it. They're gonna convince you that you have allergies, even though these are more rare and harder to diagnose than something you can buy off a website from a Google search. So thank you all for joining me today. Listen to your body and remember to do what's right for you. Stay fierce and remember that your worth is not defined by your weight, but by all the amazing things that you do. And until next time, you can chew on that.